time and space. They are fundamentally linked, like two sides of the cosmic coin. And though we experience them as two separate phenomena, together they make up space-time, the essence of the universe and the very fabric of reality. Every so often, astronomers detect tiny ripples and reverberations in this essence, disturbances in space-time itself, caused by ancient cataclysms billions of light years away. Since 2016, we have been able to detect space-time ripples which are emitted when black holes or neutron stars collide. These are not radio signals, nor are they X-rays. These are microscopic vibrations or hums in the universe itself. But to be able to understand why the collision of black holes has such a cascading effect on the rest of the universe, we have to take a step back and redefine what a black hole actually is. The black hole was first predicted following Einstein's theory of general relativity, as a region of space-time where the gravity is so strong that nothing can escape from within, not even light. Such an anomalous region can be formed when mass is compacted so tightly that the concentration and density deforms space-time itself. The resulting object then begins consuming and destroying things which get too close to it, like sinkholes in the sandbox of the universe. In practice, a black hole can be formed when a massive star, much larger than our sun, begins to die. It begins fusing iron at its core, which builds up on the inside until the star's fusion, the thing that keeps it hot, bright and radiating, cannot counteract the extreme pull of the massive star's gravity, causing the whole thing to collapse in on itself at about 25% the speed of light. In a fraction of a second, the outer layers of the star contract and then explode, leaving behind a huge, dead star core which is not producing any outward pressure, and so it too begins to fall in on itself. This crushes the core into an incredibly compact region, eventually compacting so tightly that the pressure begins breaking up atoms into subatomic particles, which push back against the collapse with a tremendous amount of force. If the collapsing core in question is less than about five times the mass of the sun, then the atoms will just about prevail, keeping the body from collapsing entirely, resulting in a city-sized ball of neutron degenerate matter known as a neutron star. However, if the core is above this five solar mass threshold, then the atoms will not be able to resist the might of gravity, and the core will collapse indefinitely, down to an infinitesimally small point where zero volume is reached. And at this density, space-time itself is deformed and warped, and gravity begins to dominate the region as our accepted model of relativity breaks down. This brings us to a fundamental idea for this video. We need to think of black holes not as massive objects, but as warped areas of space-time. Of course, they are massive, the most massive objects in the universe in fact. But it's not the mass of the black hole per se, but the effect on space-time which makes them so incredibly remarkable. Black holes have such powerful gravitational fields that they distort the light passing in and around them. The light on the outside of the black sphere doesn't necessarily fall in, rather it orbits, creating a distortion around the black hole which grows greater the closer you approach. But this can only be seen from nearby, and due to their lightless nature, black holes are impossible to observe directly from far away. Instead, we have to look for a number of telltale signs, based on their radiation, spin, and effect on their surrounding space. And this is easier for some black holes than others. Collapsing stars form stellar black holes, the smallest classification of black holes, whose mass is between five times the mass of the sun and a hundred times. At stellar scale, black holes are similar in diameter to asteroids, making them exceedingly difficult to detect. Larger black holes, namely the ones which lie at the hearts of galaxies, are classed as supermassive black holes and have masses greater than 100,000 times that of our Sun. At this scale, they are much too massive to be explainable through the collapse of a star. Instead, these black holes, also known as engine black holes, are thought to have formed from the collapse of a contracting supermassive gas cloud across space in the early universe. This would have allowed them to become very massive very early on, allowing them to attract groups of stars which eventually formed the cores of galaxies. While 100,000 suns is the lower bound mass limit, 
these black holes can grow unfathomably larger, up to billions of times the mass of the Sun, like the black hole at the heart of the largest galaxy, IC1101, estimated to be as heavy as 40 billion times the mass of the Sun. The scale is truly mind-blowing. A common misconception of black holes is that they suck everything in. While it is true that they have strong gravitational fields, these fields behave just as any other star, planet or galaxy's gravitational influence would, as an attractor. Things don't get sucked into a black hole, they orbit just as they would around a star. The difference is that black holes are the most massive objects in the universe, able to accumulate much more mass than any other star or coherent structure meaning the heaviest black holes are more massive than the heaviest non-black hole objects by several orders of magnitude. According to general relativity, the flat plane of space-time that lines our universe is curved by the presence of mass. So naturally, the most massive things in the universe will curve space-time the most and have the most powerful gravitational fields. Because it is the mass of something and not the density that causes other things to orbit it, if you replaced our sun with a black hole of equivalent mass, Earth's orbit would remain undisturbed. In fact, planets can and do orbit black holes just as they orbit other stars, but these worlds are some of the coldest and darkest worlds in the entire cosmos. Far away from a black hole, its effects are negligible. However, when you come within range of one, to within its ergosphere, the effects start to become a bit more noticeable, namely the tidal forces. Tidal forces occur when the gravitational influence acting on a body is uneven. The part nearer to the source is pulled more tightly than the part facing away and a gradient is created in the gravitational field. This is the same phenomenon that powers tides on the Earth, volcanism on Io, and around a black hole, the total and complete annihilation of everything that gets too close. When you are very near to a black hole, within a few radii of it for example, merely the difference of a few centimetres leads to radically varying gravitational influences. This rips, shreds and dismantles objects down to their last atoms, which then form a long stream only an atom or two wide. Thus, scientists call this process spaghettification, the stream of atoms falls into orbit around the black hole along its accretion disk, a spinning plane where gas and other spaghettified particles orbit very closely at immense speeds, with the largest black hole's accretion disks swirling at thousands of kilometres every single second. While black holes themselves don't have the pervasive magnetic fields that neutron stars do, the swirling of the disks heats the material within to unthinkable levels creating vast amounts of radiation, light and magnetic field activity, which we can use to identify black holes from the Earth. Smaller black holes would spaghettify you long before you came within range of the black sphere, as you are much closer to the centre where the gravitational force exerted increases exponentially. For the largest black holes, assuming you were able to survive the radiation of the accretion disk, you would probably be able to reach the black edge and cross through it well before you got spaghettified. Things fall in in large gulps before being destroyed, as opposed to being ripped apart on the outside. Another misconception about black holes is that they are all-consuming. The fact is, the amount of matter that falls into a black hole is insignificant when compared with the amount that escapes by one means or another. Even the majority of the matter along the accretion disk is spat out, escaping the perceived inescapable force. It's only beyond the event horizon of the black hole that the notion of pulling everything in starts to take hold. The event horizon is the most characterising feature of the black hole. What we typically associate with the term is actually its event horizon, the black part. With enough mass inside a sufficiently compact level of space, an event horizon will form around it a perfectly black sphere marking the area within which not even light can escape outwards to be emitted or reflected. This is because, the closer you get to something massive, the more space-time is curved and the harder it is to get away. The escape velocity, or the speed required to fly away from the black hole grows greater and greater until space-time is so curved that the escape velocity required exceeds the speed of light, the fastest speed in the universe and so not even light or electromagnetic radiation can escape to reach our eyes, and so the area just appears dark. 
The radius of the area where the escape velocity is beyond light speed is known as the Schwarzschild radius. From outside this event horizon, escape is still possible, but beneath it, space-time becomes so warped that any path you take will lead you to the black hole's centre, even at the speed of light. Between the event horizon and the centre of the black hole, there is an area which distorts space-time, and in this place, space and time switch roles. This occurs as you approach the black hole's singularity. The singularity is the region at the centre of the black hole which all the matter has collapsed down into. At this point, relativity begins to break down, as does Newtonian gravity, and quantum forces which we still do not understand take over. All the mass of the black hole is said to be concentrated into an infinitely small point with no real volume or surface area giving it an infinite density, which causes the distortion of space-time. However, this idea of infinite density might lead one to some incorrect assumptions about what a singularity actually is. The singularity, as we understand it, is a product of the mathematics of Einstein's field equations, as some of the terms become infinite within the Schwarzschild radius. As such, there are doubts as to the reality of a singularity with physical properties, as mentioned, black holes are regions of warped space-time, and therefore our equations and models which allow us to study and calculate black holes are all solving for the curvature of space-time, and not the mass or density. And when space-time is curved beyond comprehension, time begins behaving strangely. The late Stephen Hawking describes a singularity as a boundary of space-time and a place where time stops. This infinite curvature of space-time doesn't have implications for a singularity's gravity, but rather for its time. Space and time switch roles within the event horizon, and a space-time singularity becomes something that happens inside a black hole. The singularity is not a physical point, but an inevitable event. And so, the reason every path once inside the event horizon leads you to the singularity is because the singularity is an event in the future which you can't escape from just like you can't escape from that early start you have tomorrow morning. This morphing effect on time has implications for observers outside of the black hole too, because as time becomes increasingly dilated and eventually pauses for you, their time on the outside of the black hole passes as normal, and eons pass around you as you approach the singularity. But once inside and at the space-time singularity, time simply stops forever as the outside universe changes and any signal you tried to send would take an infinite amount of time to reach the outside, i.e. it would never happen. So if you think about it, it's not actually the black hole's effect on space that makes escape so impossible, but its effect on time. Whenever any matter or radiation crosses the event horizon, it falls into the singularity and grows the black hole's mass, thus increasing its event horizon and ergosphere. The question of where this mass actually ends up is a different mystery entirely. Evidently, mass doesn't disappear inside a black hole, as it increases the black hole's gravitational potential by adding mass. But where does it go? All the infalling matter and radiation seems to fall directly into the singularity, but the singularity is infinitesimally small with zero volume. So we are presented with this paradox, which has been puzzling scientists for decades. In truth, no one knows what happens to information inside a black hole, but a popular theory is that they might act as a gateway to, or even create their own, universes, due to the similarities between the singularity of a black hole and the universe as it was before the Big Bang. However, that's a theory for another video. All of the black holes we have detected up until recently are either stellar black holes, like Cygnus X1, or supermassive black holes, like Virgo A, which became the first ever black hole to be photographed in April 2019. But in between these two, there exists another classification, intermediate mass black holes, with masses between 100 solar masses and 100,000. Not quite big enough to anchor galaxies together in the wild, but certainly not your standard run-of-the-mill dead star. The thing is, is that it's not clear how black holes of this mass group come to be formed, and the case is probably different for each one. Even the largest of stars aren't massive enough to form black holes more than about 150 suns, but at the same time they are much too small to be direct collapse gas cloud black holes. As such, we don't detect these kinds of black holes anywhere near as often as the other types. 
Up until recently, we only had a handful of candidates, determined through indirect means, such as the speed of their rotating gas clouds and the spectra of their accretion disks, and so this kind is even harder to study. But, despite all of the unknowns, there is one way, besides consuming matter, that we know black holes grow larger by, through mergers. The universe's black holes have been merging and consuming each other to form larger black holes for almost as long as the universe has existed. Most black holes come together in binary mergers, where two inward spiralling black holes come within range of each other in old binary star systems of stellar black holes, or during the colliding of galaxies for the merging of supermassive black holes. In both cases, the nearer they draw, the faster they begin to circle each other until the milliseconds before they collide, when they are orbiting at a considerable percentage of the speed of light. When this happens to neutron stars, the tidal forces become so great that their shells shatter, releasing the enormous amounts of superconcentrated matter within their cores. This matter is then under a fraction of the pressure it was before, and it explodes in a cataclysmic, violent, kilnova explosion. When black holes collide, they don't explode, because no shell exists to be shattered, and nothing is released from either black hole's singularity. But with that said, there is an energy release when black holes collide, and an insane amount of it at that, but this isn't in the form of an explosion. In the seconds before the two black holes eat each other, their superfast orbits releases the energy equivalent to several suns in a few milliseconds as reverberations in the fabric of space-time, called gravitational waves, like ripples on a pond. These waves propagate away from the source at the speed of light, so powerful that they can travel for billions of years. The universe is humming with gravitational wave activity, and we can now detect them with very sensitive interferometry equipment here on Earth. Every verified gravitational wave signal to date has come from a binary merger of either neutron stars or black holes, and were detected using LIGO. LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which is situated at two locations on opposite ends of the United States. It has been operational since 2002, but in 2015 it received an upgrade, leading to the first confirmed detection of waves in the following year. The confirmation of gravitational waves has opened up an entirely new paradigm of science, and offers a unique new means to study our universe. In the four years since, LIGO, and its collaboration with the Virgo Observatory in Italy, have detected ten further gravitational wave events. All of the signals consist of chirps of waves, and have a very unique sound. LIGO uses mirrors placed four kilometers apart at both of its two observatories. The interferometer uses lasers to measure disturbances caused by gravitational waves as they sweep across the Earth and disturb the light. LIGO is so sensitive that it can detect a change in laser light down to atomic distances. The detectors are constantly listening for waves passing through the Earth, and algorithms then sift through the data looking for changes in the signal. These algorithms search for specific patterns in the waves associated with binary mergers, and also for out-and-out -out disturbances caused by flashes of energy. Their recent discovery was the latter, a particularly strong gravitational wave event caused by two improbably massive black holes colliding, and the resulting black hole is the first to be classed as an intermediate mass black hole. The gravitational wave signal is dubbed GW190521, after the date it was first picked up, the 21st of May 2019. The signal consists of four short wiggles, lasting for less than a tenth of a second. During this time, two black holes with a combined mass of more than 150 suns came together. Both merging black holes were stellar scale, one at 66 solar masses and the other at 85 solar masses. They came together to form a much larger, intermediate-mass black hole, weighing 142 times the mass of the Sun, thus placing it in the intermediate-mass group. The remaining eight or nine solar masses radiated away from the collision site in the form of gravitational waves, which have only just reached us now after several billion years. 
the signal was detected from redshift 0.8, meaning the resulting black hole has now receded over 5.3 gigaparsecs away. That's about 17 billion light years from the Earth. This means that, in order to have reached us now, the collision must have occurred about 7 billion years ago, when the universe was half its current age and much, much smaller. The waves that were emitted on that day have been travelling through ever-expanding intergalactic space for billions of years since, and the black hole it formed is probably now much more massive and mature. But it is the combined mass of the merger at the time of this event that has scientists so intrigued, because of the highly unusual numbers involved. The process of a star going supernova explains how stars up to 130 times the mass of the Sun can collapse to form black holes up to 65 times the mass of the Sun. For stars more massive than this, a phenomenon called pair instability takes hold. When the photons at the core of a star become too energetic, they morph into electron and anti-electron pairs. These generate much less outward pressure than the photons, and so the star becomes unstable, like it would do in a supernova, but this time it collapses even faster with less outward pressure to counteract it, and the supernova is so strong that the entire thing is blown to pieces. Neither a black hole nor a neutron star is left behind, and so black holes above 65 times the mass of the Sun probably don't form in this way. Hypermassive stars, at least 200 times the mass of the Sun, do form black holes when they die, but these are at least 120 solar masses. So we are left with this highly unusual gap between 65 solar masses and 120. The pair instability gap, or the upper black hole mass gap. So it would be pretty puzzling to see a stellar black hole within this unaccounted for mass group, and yet both black holes associated with this merger fall into this grey area. Both constituents are the first black holes to be detected which fall into this unlikely gap, which is why some people can't resist calling them impossible black holes. However, that's incredibly misleading, as they are far from impossible. The 66 solar mass black hole, however improbable, may just be a particularly massive stellar black hole. But as for the 85 solar mass black hole, it also is likely the product of a merger of smaller stellar black holes. The resulting 142 solar mass black hole is most likely the latest descendant in a complex hierarchy of black hole mergers, and is by far the largest black hole detected through gravitational wave technology, as well as being the first direct evidence of an intermediate mass black hole ever recorded. In short, it's a pretty spectacular discovery. Black hole mergers have probably played an instrumental role in forming the largest engine black holes that we see today. With their unparalleled masses, it seems almost inevitable that these attractors will find one another in the darkness of space, colliding to create larger black holes in a never-ending, ever-increasing cycle of cosmic cannibalism. While scientists think that the universe is going to keep on expanding forever, one alternate theory, known as the Big Crunch, holds that the universe might eventually reach a tipping point, where its expansion will stop and it will begin collapsing in on itself and contracting due to the gravity of the objects on the inside. By the time this happens, there will be sextillions of black holes out there as the largest stars die out. And should the universe begin contracting, these will all be brought back in range of each other as space shrinks. This will lead to black hole mergers all over the universe, leading to larger black holes far beyond what is hypothesised to exist in the universe today. This will continue until the final moments of time, when the universe becomes so small that all of the black holes are squashed together into a black hole incalculably more massive than anything that has ever existed, containing the mass and information of the entire universe's stars, galaxies and matter. This black hole will then devour space-time itself, pulling the entire universe into its singularity and thus ending its existence. And, because our universe is theorised to have begun as a singularity, you can see why some people believe that this would cause a new universe and a new Big Bang to occur. But then, that's quite a presumptuous theory, not least because the universe will, in all likelihood, continue to expand for the rest of eternity. But however crazy an idea, it just goes to re-emphasise the fascinating and inescapable power black holes wield in this universe. 
There's just something about staring into the blackness of an event horizon that gives you this sense of inevitability that they must be connected to the existence of the universe somehow. We're not sure what the maximum mass black hole LIGO can observe is, so maybe in the coming years we will feel the reverberations of an even larger merger. If we investigate them enough, the hope is that future generations could use gravitational wave research to perhaps invent technology capable of producing artificial gravitational waves, giving us the ability to manipulate the fabric of space and time on demand. In the meantime, the next big gravitational wave innovation is the upcoming Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, or LISA, due to launch in 2034 consisting of three spacecraft forming a triangle of lasers spanning 2.5 million kilometers, thus making it the largest and most ambitious space mission ever conceived. It will track disturbances in the laser light to a precision of a 50 billionth of a meter, less than the width of a helium atom, dramatically increasing the amount of events we will be able to pick up, and it will likely identify thousands of wave sources in the first year of operation perhaps finally shedding light onto the long-sought true nature of the black hole.